Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about nonlinear systems. Previously, we've only worked with linear equations, or inequalities, but a system is not required to be linear. A system of equations, or inequalities, is just multiple relations that are true at the same time. It's just different things that we know are all true at the same time. That's a system. For example, we could look for the solutions to the system x equals y squared and 3x plus 6y equals 9. For it to be a solution to the system, it has to be some x comma y pair that makes both equations true at the same time. It has to satisfy each part of our system. Solving the system will wind up being very similar to solving a system of linear equations. We'll look at how we can apply the three methods of substitution, elimination, and graphing, just like we talked about when we were solving systems of linear equations. After that, we'll also look at finding the solutions to a system of nonlinear inequalities. Uh, it would be helpful to watch the previous two lessons if you're just jumping into this one as the first one on this stuff. We'll be reviewing methods, but we won't be really teaching any of them in depth. So if you really want to get the chance to learn substitution, elimination, graphing, it'd be great to watch the previous ones. But if you've already seen them, you're good to go. All right. Substitution is the most fundamental way to solve any system of equations. You just put one variable in terms of the other or the others, then you substitute it in and you work to a solution. For example, if we've got x equals y squared, 3x plus 6y equals 9. Well, we notice, hey, we've got x here, we've got x here, so we can plug in and we'll have 3 times what it was over here, y squared plus 6y equals 9. So we've got 3y squared plus 6y equals 9. It's nice not to have as many variables. We see that we can divide, I mean, sorry, as many numbers. So we see we can divide by the number 3. We have y squared plus 2y equals 3. At this point, we look at it and we go, oh, hey, that looks just like solving a polynomial. Let's do it like we're solving a polynomial. So we move everything over. So we have a 0 on one side. So we've got y squared plus 2y minus 3 equals 0. We see, can we factor this? Yeah, it's not too difficult for us to factor. So we go y plus 3y minus 1 equals 0, right? We check that, y times y, y squared, good. y minus 1 plus 3y, that gets us plus 2y, good. 3 times negative 1, negative 3, good to go. So at this point, we can solve for what are our y's going to be. So we have y plus 3 equals 0 is one possibility. y minus 1 equals 0 is another possibility. So we've got y equals negative 3, y equals positive 1. Those are our two possible worlds, right? So in one world, let's make it the red world, we have y equals 1. So y equals equals 1. Now we can solve for what is our x going to be by just plugging it in. So x equals y squared. So now we plug in what is it x going to be when y is 1. We plug that in. x equals 1 squared. So x equals 1. So in the red world, when we plug in y equals 1, we get x equals 1. So we've got the point 1 comma 1 is an answer to both of these equations. However, we've also got another world that we can check out to make this one the green world. We've got y equals negative 3. So what happens when we plug that one in? So we'll wind up having x equals negative 3 squared. x equals negative 3 squared, so we have x equals positive 9. So that's the other one. So in the green world, we've got x equals 9, y equals negative 3. 9 comma negative 3 is the other point that would solve this. And that's how you do it by substitution. You just get one variable on its lonesome, plug it in, swap out the other ones, and then work your way to a solution. In elimination, we add a multiple of one equation to the other to eliminate variables. So in this case, if we have x equals y squared and 3x plus 6y equals 9, well, we notice, hey, we've got x's here, we've got x's here. We can make the x's on our left be the same number as the other one, but opposite in negative. So let's multiply everything by negative 3. So we have negative 3x equals negative 3y squared. So now we can bring this over, we can add it over, and we have plus negative 3x equals negative 3y squared. We can add that on either side. We add that on either side. 3x and negative 3x, they cancel out. We've got 6y equals 9 minus 3y squared. We move this over. We've got 3y squared plus 6y minus 9 equals 0. Hey, this is starting to look familiar, right? We divide everything by 3y squared plus 2y minus 3 equals 0. And now we're just where we were with substitution at this point. We solve this like a polynomial to figure out what are our values of y, and then we use that to figure out what are our values of x going to be. What are our possible values of y, and then we figure out what are our possible values of x from that. So that's how we would use elimination.
Now, in general, elimination, I would say, is less useful for nonlinear systems. It still works, but it can be difficult to eliminate variables because the equations aren't linear, so they don't match up as easily for cancellation, right? So like in this one we have here, we have y squared over here, but, you know, y squared doesn't show up anywhere over here, right? There's no y squared over here, so we can't try to cancel out y squared. We were lucky enough that we had an x in one of them and an x in the other one, so we could cancel out x terms, but we can't necessarily cancel out everything because there's various ways, since we're no longer stuck with, you know, just being, just limited to using linear things, we can have all sorts of weird things, right? We could have sine of x, uh, exponential function of t, all sorts of things for our variables that it makes them not really fit together, so elimination doesn't really work that well. It's still useful and usable when you're in the right situation, so you can keep a lookout for it, but don't rely on it as much as you do when you're working with linear systems. Graphing. We can also graph each equation in the system. Wherever they intersect is a solution to the system. Remember, this is because a graph shows us all of the points that are true. All of the solutions to a single equation are its graph. So if we find a solution to both of our equations at the same time, that would have to be on both of the graphs at the same time. So wherever they intersect is a location that is a solution to both systems because it's on the graph of both, uh, it's on both graphs. Cool. So if we had x equals y squared, 3x plus 6y equals 9, we could look at this and we could see, hey, x equals y squared, that winds up making the red curve, 3x plus 6y equals 9, that makes the blue curve, they intersect at those locations, and so those are our solutions. Great. Now, if you've got a graphing calculator, you can use that to find the points of intersection for the system. Remember, graphing calculators are this really great tool for being able to like quickly find it. If you can graph the two of them, wherever the two graphs intersect on your graphing calculator, you can tell it, calculate what is the value of that intersection point, and it will just spit out the numbers to get that intersection point. Now, if you are going to do this, you have to first put equations into the form y equals stuff involving x, right? y equals stuff involving some other variable. Because that's how the graphing calculator takes things in. So you'd have to get this x equals y squared, 3x plus 6y equals 9 into the forms that would be y equals things. So for example, 3x plus 6y equals 9, we'd have 6y equals negative 3x plus 9. We divide everything by 6 and we'd have y equals negative 3 halves x plus right? And so that's our blue curve right there. We could plug that into a graphing calculator, that would appear. Y, x equals y squared, that's a little bit different. If we've got x equals y squared, well, we want to get y on its lonesome. To do that, we take the square root of both sides. But remember, if you take square root of both sides, you have to have a plus or minus show up, right? So we've got plus or minus x equals y. But that's two equations at the same time. That's positive and negative. So we have to take this and we split it into two different things. We split it into y equals the positive x and y equals the negative root x. So positive root x and negative root x. And so that gives us the positive root x is the top half of our sideways parabola, parabola and negative root x is the bottom half of our sideways parabola. So if we plugged in all three of those into our graphing calculator, we could then use the intersection ability to figure out where they're going to be. If we just solve for y equals positive root x and put in just the top half, we'd wind up only getting one of the answers and we miss the other one. So it's important when you're working through with a graphing calculator to really pay attention to how are you getting this into a form that you can plug it into your graphing calculator. Is this really the same as the equation I started with? Okay. The number of solutions isn't going to be as fixed as it was when we were dealing with linear systems. So when we worked with linear systems, there were only three possibilities for the number of solutions. There was going to be one solution, no solutions whatsoever, or infinitely many solutions when we just wound up having the same line on top of itself. But with a nonlinear system, all bets are off. There can be any number of solutions at all. The only way to figure out how many solutions there are is by solving the system or by looking at a really good graph of it. So for example, this one on the left, we wind up seeing that it's got three solutions because it intersects here, here, and here. And this one just has a crazy huge number of solutions because we've got the first intersections, but then here we've got one here and here and here, and then it just starts to pack in and pack in and pack in as we get closer because that red graph is going up and down really, really quickly. So you wind up seeing lots of solutions in some cases. Um, you won't wind up having to work with anyone there, any like this. It'd probably be a little too difficult at this point. But 
just understand that the number of solutions that you're going to get out of a nonlinear system isn't any fixed value. It's not like linear systems where you could rely on it's going to just be one. There's no known number that it's going to be, and the only way to work it out is by working it out. Systems of nonlinear inequalities. So when we're working with nonlinear inequalities, it's basically the same as when you're working with linear inequalities. The first step is to graph each of the inequalities. Graph it, and the way you graph it is you graph it as if it were an equation. Oh, whoops, there was a mistake in the graph here. We'll fix it in just a second. So you graph them as if they were equations with lines, right? However, you don't necessarily just use straight lines all the time. If it's a dashed, you use it dashed when it is a strict inequality, strictly less than or strictly greater than. So notice in this case, we've got y is strictly greater than 2x squared minus 5. So this red one, that's the graph of 2x squared minus 5. It needs to be dashed because it is a strictly greater than. So let's go through and let's dash that real quickly. So. That's how it should look, is it should be dashed. OK, so a dashed line for the greater than, because it's saying if you were actually on the line, if the point is on the line, it is not a solution. And then after that, you shade it appropriately. You use test points to help you figure it out. So for this one, let's use 0, 0. Since neither of the lines fall straight on 0, 0, it makes a great test point. So 0, comma 0, if we plug that into y is greater than 2x squared minus 5. We've got 0 for y is greater than 2 times 0 squared minus 5. 0 is indeed greater than negative 5, so that checks out. We know that the side that we are going to be shading in is the side facing this purple dot for the red, our red equation. So we shade in this stuff here. Okay, now the blue one, the blue curve less than or equal to 1 fifth x squared plus 2, that's our blue curve right here. Let's use that same test point. So we plug in 0 comma 0. Let's check what happens with that. So plug in 0 for our y. 0 is less than or equal to 1 fifth times 0 squared plus 2. And indeed, 0 is less than or equal to 2. So that checks out. So that tells us that we are going to have the blue side shade towards our purple test point. So we shade towards our purple test point. So we're shading everything underneath and including that curve, that blue curve. So everything underneath this blue curve is included in it in this equation. This sorry, not equation, but inequality. And everything above the red parabola is included in this one. So the part where they overlap is the space between the two parabolas. So we can color that out. Now it's getting a little confusing to see things, but we see we color that out with the purple, and we can see this is the space that solves, that satisfies our system of inequalities. Because if you are inside of this space, you wind up being true for both of the inequalities at the same time, and that's how we figure it out. We shade it and be able to figure it out by shading each one of them individually, and then where all of the shadings agree, where all the shadings overlap, that is our set of solutions. That is the set of points that satisfies our system of inequalities. All right, we're ready for some examples. So first example, xy equals 2. So we want to get something where we can plug it into the other one. Well, we see y equals negative 1 plus x. So let's take this. We'll swap out y, swap out ne for negative 1 plus x. So we plug that in over here. So we've got x times the negative 1 plus x for y. Negative 1 plus x equals 2. So multiply our x over. We've got negative x plus x squared equals 2. This looks like a polynomial, so let's solve it like a polynomial. x squared minus x, subtract the 2 over, so we've got x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0. At this point, we factor. x looks like it's going to have minus 2 and x plus 1. Check it real quick on our head. x times x, x squared, great. x plus 1, so 1x minus 2x, that gets us minus x. minus 2 times 1, negative 2, great, checks out. So at this point, we can solve for it. x minus 2 equals 0, or x plus 1 equals 0. Those are the two possible worlds. So we've got x equals 2 
and x equals negative 1. Great, those are our two possibilities. We'll arbitrarily choose two different uh, colors for them, so let's make green world is when x equals 2. So we can plug it in over here, x equals 2. Actually, we can plug it into either one. Um, looks to me like it's probably a little easier to plug it into this one, but we could plug it into either of the equations if we wanted. So we've got y equals negative 1 plus when x is 2. So y equals negative 1 plus 2 gets us positive 1. So one of our, our first point that we figured out is 2 comma positive 1. So our first answer. Then we'll arbitrarily choose another color. So in the purple world, we were going to have x equal to negative 1. So when x equals negative 1, we plug that one in. So we've got y equals negative 1 plus the x value that we're plugging in, negative 1. So y equals negative 1 plus negative 1 gets us negative 2. So that gives us the point x value negative 1, y value negative 2. And that is our two solutions. So our purple solution and our green solution are all of the solutions to this system. All right, next example, find the solutions to this system. So in this case, we see, hey, y already over here just by itself. So it looks like an easy candidate for substitution. So let's plug x squared plus 2 in for y over here. So we plug that in. We've got x squared plus 2, right, since that was what y used to be, equals, oh, whoops, squared. We have to have everything continue to be the same x minus 1. So x squared plus 2 squared equals x minus 1. At this point, that might raise our suspicions a little bit, but let's keep working it out and see what happens. So that gets x to the fourth plus 4x squared plus 4 equals x minus 1. Hmm. This might this might start to raise our suspicions about what we're looking at. Is it possible for this equation to ever be true? Is there some x value that would make the left-hand side the same thing as the right-hand side here? Well, let's keep working it out, see if we can get something that will make it obvious what we're looking at. So x to the fourth plus 4x squared plus 5 equals x. Okay, so if we look at this, we might realize we, we could try to solve it from this point, but we aren't certain that there's solutions, right? It said if possible. So we want to be just a little bit suspicious because it can be a real pain to try to solve something for a long time if it turns out that it's impossible to solve. So you want to be able to figure out, is this possible to solve before you get too deep into the process of trying to solve it? So x to the fourth plus 4x squared plus 5. Well, what does that look like? What would we wind up seeing there? Well, that's going to be a really, really fast growing graph that starts at some height of 5 and then shoots up really quickly, right? x to the fourth plus 4x squared, it never becomes negative. So that's what the left-hand side is equal to. But the right-hand side, x, well, what would that wind up being? That's going to be here. And if we graphed just x, that would go like this. Now, we're appealing to a graph to understand this, but we see that the left-hand side is going to always be putting out much larger numbers, no matter what x we put in, than the right-hand side is ever going to be able to put out. We've got x to the fourth plus 4x squared plus 5. That's going to make really big numbers, always positive, really quickly. Now, x, it can wind up getting po large positive numbers, but it has to put in very large x to do that. And if we put in a very large x on the right side, the left side will be ginormous. So we see that these two sides, they can never match up. So our suspicion is that there's actually no solution here. We could try to move that x over and have it equal zero, but remember some parabolas, some, uh, not in this case it's not a parabola because it's a fourth degree, um, but some polynomials don't have solutions. They never touch the uh, x-axis if we're searching for when is it equal to zero. We're searching for roots. So we wind up being able to figure out that this won't work, but we want something that really makes it more obvious than just having to turn this into equation and see this and it just, it seems a little bit uncertain. So the best way for this is actually going to be to graph it. If we graph it, we'll see that this very clearly can never work out. So we can graph both of our original equations, x squared plus 2 equals y, and y squared equals x minus 1. So we'll make a tick mark length of 1, 3, 4, go out to 4 on each 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, one, two, three, four, great. So let's first graph the easy one, x squared plus two equals y. That one's pretty easy for us to graph. We'll graph this guy in blue. So x squared plus two equals y. Well, we start at a height of two, right? We plug in x equals zero and we get at a height of two. Plug in x equals one, now we're at a height of three. 
negative one, same thing. At two, we'll be way out at a height of six. So we see that we're going to curve out very quickly. We're going to shoot out like this, right? So that is what the curve winds up being. Don't get that part confused. The graph is not actually connecting to that circled part. So the blue graph goes to x squared plus 2 equals y. What about y squared equals x minus 1? Now, we're used to saying solving things in terms of y equals stuff. But that's actually not going to be the easiest way to do this, because then you have to take square root, and you have a positive and a negative side because it's plus or minus square root. What we can do is y squared minus, sorry, plus 1, we add 1 to both sides, equals x. And so we can solve this from y's point of view as being the input and x being the output. So for example, if y is 0, what does x wind up being? If y is 0, then x winds up being 1, right? So at y 0, height of 0 on the horizontal axis, x will wind up being positive 1. 0 squared plus 1 equals positive 1. At a height of 1, when we plug in y equals 1, x will wind up being 1 squared plus 1, 2. At a height of 2, when y is at the height of 2, we plug that in, we have y squared plus 1, so 2 squared plus 1, 4 plus 1, 5 is going to be our x value somewhere out here. Same thing if we plugged in negative height. So negative 1 will wind up getting us an x value of 2. Negative 2 will wind up getting us an x value of positive 5 as well. Sorry, did I say negative 2 for negative? A height of negative 1 will get us an x value of positive 2, just in case I said the wrong thing back there. And then we curve this out like this, because it's going to be a parabola as well, because it's, you know, got that degree curve that just a little bit better so we can see it more accurately. Curves out like this, and goes out like this. So notice, the red one's going to keep going out to the right. The blue one's going to keep going up. They're never going to wind up touching each other, right? This cup goes like this. This cup goes like this. They go out like that. They're never going to touch each other. They're never going to intersect. There is no way for these things to ever connect to each other. They can't ever connect to each other because we see that graphing them, they fail to ever touch. So with that in mind, we see that there are no solutions. There's no solutions to this system. All right, next up. Graph the solutions to the system of inequalities. Y is less than 3 times cosine x. Y is greater than or equal to x squared. And x is less than 1. Now, we haven't explicitly said that we're going to be using trigonometric things, but we're basically at that point where we're going to assume that you've gone through the trig trigonometry lessons. So we're probably used to it. If you're not used to it, just trust that I am giving you an accurate depiction of how 3 cosine x works. So y is less than 3 cosine x. So first thing let's do, let's set up a nice large graph because we're trying to graph the solution to the system of inequalities. Since we're working with cosine, we know that we're going to want at least out to 2 pi on either side. So pi, 3.14, 2 pi, 6.28 approximately. So we want to go out to probably at least 7 marks horizontally either direction. A tick mark will be a length of 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so I actually drew a little bit more than was necessary. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK. So let's graph each one of these. First, we'll graph uh, y is less than 3 cosine x in green. Now, notice it's less than, so it's going to be dashed. So let's get some points so that we can draw in this line properly. So if we plug in x equals 0, remember we're in radians. We're not using degrees here. Otherwise, our, our x-axis would have to be huge. So at radians, if we plug in 0, x is 0, then we're going to have cosine as cosine of 0 will spit out 1. So we'll have 3 times 1, so it'll be the height of 3 when we're at a horizontal location of 0. Halfway at pi over 2, which is a little bit over 1 and a half, right? 1.5 and change. So 1.5 and change will be at 0, right? Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so 3 times 0 is 0. Same thing if we go over to the negative pi over 2, around halfway between 1 and 2. Then at pi, we're going to wind up having negative 3. So because cosine of pi is negative 1, so 3 times cosine of pi will be negative 3. So 3.14, little bit past the 3 marker. We're here. And then 
same thing over here at negative pi, same thing, so negative 3, a little bit past the negative 3 marker. So we can curve out what cosine looks like, what we know before, in this portion right here. Okay, uh, we can do the same thing with continuing this graph out. So we know at 2 pi, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, around 6.28, we'll be back up to a height of 3. We know halfway between the two at around 4.6, 4.7 or so, you know, we use with 3 pi over 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and a little bit over halfway, we'll be back at a height of 0. Same thing going the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative, a little bit over negative 4 and a half, and then 5, 6, a little bit over 6, and there we go, a little bit over negative 6. So we can curve in a little bit more of this, like that. Now notice at this point, technically made a mistake because was it was it a strict inequality yeah it was a strict inequality it was strictly less than so if that's the case we can't be using a solved line we have to be using a dashed line it was a little bit easier for me to draw it so i'm just going to come in with my eraser and i'm going to erase this into being dashed which i'm sure we've all done at some point where we accidentally draw something as solid and realize oh i have to make this dash now you come through with an eraser and just erase it into a dash form So at this point, we've got y is less than 3 cosine x, at least the line, the curve generated by it, graphed in. We'll shade it in in a little bit. Next up, we'll do y is greater than or equal to x squared in blue. This one's much easier. We know at x is 0, we're at a height of 0 at 1, 1, at 2, positive 4. Same thing on the other side to negative 2, positive 4. And we curve out just in a nice handy parabola, much faster. And since it's greater than or equal to, it actually makes a solid line because it's not a strict inequality. It's not strict. And then finally, x is less than 1, we'll do in red. So that means that x has to be something less than 1. So that means we've fixed x at 1 for drawing the actual graph, for drawing the curve. We're going to fix x at 1, and then we'll see y is allowed to go to anything at once. Because for x is less than 1, y can be anything at once. x less than 1 doesn't care what y is. So we fix x at 1 and we draw a dashed line because it is a strict inequality. It says x has to be less than 1. It's not allowed to actually be equal to 1. We have a dashed line for that. So now we figure out, we do some shading, figure out what is allowed for each one of these. So y is less than 3 cosine x. We could do a test point at 0, 0, right? Test point at 0, 0. 0 is less than 3 times cosine of 0, so 0 is less than 3. Hey, that's perfectly true, and which makes sense because y less than means we're also going to be looking at the part that would be below the curve. So what's below the curve? Stuff like this, right? Not doing very extreme job shading just because we want to have some idea of where we're looking. So don't have to shade too much right now until we figure out where they all agree. Y greater than or equal to x squared, we can't use the test point 0, 0 because it's actually on our line. So we have to choose a new one. Let's try 0, 1. So 1 is greater than or equal to 0 squared. Indeed, that's true. Also, since it's y is greater than or equal, we know it has to be above the curve. So what's above the curve? This stuff here. Great. And then finally, if x is less than 1, we have to be to the left side of it because our x value has to be below it. We could also use a test point like 0, 0. We don't care about the y value, but 0 is less than 1, so we shade towards that test point of 0, 0. So we'd go in to the left. Great. So at this point, we've seen the only thing that they can agree on is this little part right in the middle that we're now shading with green. And there we go. And that's how we figure out where these things go. Cool. All right. Example four, a rectangular box has the following properties. The sum of its edges is 24 feet. Adding together the area of each of its faces gives a total of 22 square feet. Its height is twice its width. And then we're asked to find out what is its volume. So the first thing to do is we want to get a sense of what are we looking at. So let's draw a quick picture. So if we've got a box, right, some box.
Okay, so it has three things to it, right? Length, width, and height. So we can see that we've got, you know, what's its length? What is its width? And what is its height? Great. So with that in mind, let's start trying to figure out how do these properties turn into math? The sum of its edges is 24 feet. The sum of its edges. Now, technically, we don't really know. Are they saying just one of its edges each time, or are they saying all of its edges? So sometimes you wind up seeing things that are a little bit confusing in math. If you saw this on a test, it'd probably be a good idea to ask your teacher, because you're not sure, does that mean H plus W plus L, or does that mean each edge of the box all added together? So let's go with the sum of every edge. Let's say that's what it means. But notice how each of its edges, the sum of its edges, well, that could be considered just be the three edges, the sort of fundamental edges, height, width, and length. But it could also be all of the times they show up on the box, right? If you've got a rectangular object, it shows up here and here and here, right? Height actually shows up four times because we've got each of the sort of columns that make up our box. So we've got a height here, a height here, a height here and a height here. So we can think of it, if we're looking at every edge, as it's going to be four height will be what a, part of what's going into that. So the sum of not just its edges, but every edge is how we'll do this problem. All right, so if that's the case, this first thing is going to wind up coming out to be, so first idea will come out to be 4H plus 4W plus 4L equals 24 feet, right? So height, width, and length all combined together comes up to a total of 24 feet because the sum of every edge, every one of the edges, and each edge, height will show up four times. Width will show up four times on the box. Length will show up four times on the box. If you find this confusing, try just finding some rectangular object that you can look at, like pick up an actual box and count the edges. Count how many times its height shows up. You know, any rectangular box will be able to show you this idea if it's a little confusing. Physical things are a great way to explore stuff in math. Next up, adding together the area of each of its faces. So this one's a little bit tougher. So how many times does, let's say, like this face right here, the very front face show up? Well, we see that height times width would be the area of that face. So height times width is going to get multiplied together. But it doesn't show up just on the front. It also shows up on the back side, right? So it's the front side, but also the back side, both sides. So it's not going to be just h times w, but 2 times h times uh, 2 hw. By that same logic, each of the side faces, so we're going to have l times h, right? Because it's h over here. So the side faces will show up twice as well. So we've got 2lh. And then finally, the top face is going to be the length times the width. So two length times width. And we were told that came out to be 22 square feet total. So we can find the area of each one of the faces. HW will be one of the faces, and then it doubles up each time. LH will be the area of one face. It doubles up, so on and so forth. So we've got 2HW plus 2LH plus 2LW equals 22. And then finally, we were told that the height is twice its width. So that's probably the easiest one of all. If the height is equal to twice the width, so two times the width. Great. At this point, how do we find volume? What's volume based on? Well, if it's a nice rectangular box, volume is just equal to all three of these variables multiplied together, H times L times W. Great, so that's all the steps that we need together to be able to figure out what this is going to be, to be able to get this in a position where we can solve it. So now let's start working it out. So we've got 4L plus 4W plus 4H equals 24, 2LW plus 2W, 2WH plus 2LH equals 22, H equals 2W, and we're looking for volume, which is going to be L times W times H. Great. So I'd say the very first thing to do, let's take 4L plus 4W plus 4H. Let's take a little bit easier. Let's divide everything by 4. So we've got L plus W plus H equals 24 over 4 gets us 6. Same thing over here, let's divide everything by 2, so that gets us LW plus WH plus LH equals 11. Great. So at this point, we can actually start figuring things out. So let's try to solve in terms of W, right? We've got W over here, H is already ready to be substituted in somewhere. So since it's connected to W, we can probably figure out W easiest from what we've got set up here. So we can plug that in over here. If H equals 2W, then we have L 
plus w plus what was h equal to? h was equal to 2w. So plus 2w equals 6. So l plus w plus 2w, 3w equals 6. So l equals 6 minus 3w. Now at this point, we're ready to substitute l in as well. So we've got h ready to substitute, l ready to substitute. So we can now go into our big equation, lw plus wh plus lh equals 11. So we plug in here, l is 6 minus 3w. So 6 minus 3w plus times w plus w times h is 2w times, sorry, plus L, L is 6 minus 3W times H is 2W equals 11. 6 minus 3W times W, W distributes, so we've got 6W minus 3W squared plus W distributes onto 2W, well not distributes, but 2W squared plus 6 minus 3W times 2W, so 6 times 2W becomes 12W, minus 3W times 2W becomes minus 6W squared equals 11. Great. So let's simplify things a bit. We've got minus 3w here plus 2w squared here and minus 6w squared here. So minus 3w squared plus 2w squared gets us negative 1w squared. Minus 6w squared brings us to a total of negative 7w squared. Our 6w and 12w combines to plus 18w equals 11. Hey, we've got squared, we've got single degree of 1, and we've got constant. This looks like a polynomial. Let's get it into an easy to solve polynomial format. Add 7w squared to both sides, minus 18w to both sides, plus 11. So at this point, we could toss this into the quadratic formula and solve out the answers, but we might be able to get lucky. And even though it looks a little complex, we might realize, oh, hey, we can factor this. Not too difficult to factor. We get lucky. We notice that it turns out it's pretty easy to factor. 7w and w here. We need to have minus on both of them because it comes out to be positive 11 minus 18w. We've got a 7w here, so this will be minus 1, and this will be minus 11. So 7w times w, 7w squared. 7w minus 1 minus 7w minus 11 times w minus 11w. So negative 7w minus 11w, negative 18w checks out. Negative 11 times negative 1 checks out positive 11. Great. Always a good idea to check when you're factoring. So we can now solve each one of these. 7w minus 11 equals 0, or w minus 1 equals 0. So we've actually got two different possible worlds. It didn't say that in the problem, but there's two different possible worlds for how much, what the width of the box can be. It can be 11 over 7 or 1. So 11 over 7 and 1 are our two possible things. So let's call these arbitrarily. We'll make colors for these. So uh, w equals 1. That one looks easiest to solve. Deal with first. So we'll make that the purple world. So w equals 1. If that's the case, we can figure out that h equals 2w. We plug that in. h equals 2 times 1. So we've got h is 2. And then we've also got, if it's w equals 1, we plug that into l equals 6 minus 3w. So l equals 6 minus 3 times 1. So 6 minus 3 equals 3. So we've got w equals 1, h equals 2, L equals 3 in our first world, in this purple world. Because remember, there's two possibilities for what our width could be. But if this is the case, then our volume is going to be the three of these multiplied together. So 1 times 2 times 3, which equals 6. So one possible, val vo one possible value for our volume is going to be 6 cubic feet. That's one possible answer, right? It turns out that there's two different worlds here, so we want to check out both of them. The other one will make this the green world, where the width is equal to 11 over 7. Well, if width equals 11 over 7, then we can plug that into h equals 2w. So h equals 2 times 11 over 7, which equals 22 over 7. So our height is 22 over 7 if we've got h. Sorry, if our width is 11 over 7, then our height is 22 over 7. And then we can also figure out what is our length going to be? Length equals 6 minus 3w. W in this case is 11 over 7. So we've got 6 minus 33 over 7, which winds up simplifying out to 9 over 7. Great. So at this point, we've got width equals 11 over 7, height equals 22 over 7, and length equals 9 over 7, all of these in feet as the units.
So at this point, we know that the volume is equal to each one of these multiplied together. So 11 over 7 times 22 over 7 times 9 over 7. We multiply these all out together, and it becomes 2,178 divided by 343, which is really not that easy to see what that means. So let's approximate that using a calculator, and that comes out to be 6.3. So our other possibility is the volume comes out to be 6.35 cubic feet. So it turns out that there's actually a larger possible box if we're not going with these nice friendly integer things, but we can still follow the three requirements. So those three conditions that were given to us, it turns out that there's two different possible boxes that actually fit those conditions, and those are the volumes. In our purple world where our width was one, we got six cubic feet, and in our green world where our width was 11 over seven, we got 6.35 cubic feet. And if you wanted to check this, if you wanted to make sure that everything was great, a good thing to do would be to see, hey, I've got width equals one, height equals two, length equals three and then just try plugging that into each of these three equations that we started with and making sure yeah that checks out yeah that checks out yeah that checks out same thing over here for the 6.35 value uh, sorry not the 6.35 value not that but the width equals 11 over 7 height equals 22 over 7 length equals 9 over 7 you can just plug that into each of these three equations and make sure that it checks out in each one because if it checks out in each one you know that is a workable answer all right, so that finishes up our work with systems of equations of all types, and we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.